Uh, let's go ahead and um, get started. Hi, everybody. I'm Dominic Tarpey. I'm a social worker and uh, analyst here at Langley Porter and Department of Psychiatry. And welcome to our last Grand Rounds for this year. Before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to just say a quick couple housekeeping things. One is, well, the main thing is, although most of us are probably pretty familiar with Zoom, this is the first time we're using it uh, for our grand rounds. So bear with us if there's some hiccups. Dr. Lee will have some polling questions and some breakout rooms, and I'll uh, do my best to moderate. And please use the chat to send any questions that you have for Dr. Lee and anything else uh, that you want to send along. And I'll try to um, piece them together and summarize and, and have them ready for uh, Dr. Lee to respond to. So uh, I think with no further ado, we'll get started. Dr. Descartes Lee is our speaker today. He's a professor of psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry at UCSF and at Langley Porter. He is uh, the director of the Bipolar Disorder Program. He's also director of the UCSF Electroconvulsive Therapy Service. And then Finally, Director of the Medical Student Education in the UCSF Department of Psychiatry. His interest areas are education and educational scholarship, bipolar disorder, ECT, suicide, faculty development, and medical education. Dr. Lee did his uh, training here at UCSF, and I think, well, he's, I work with him a lot. He's a, a great colleague, and this is his second talk for this Grand Round season. And so much appreciated, and I'll turn it over to Descartes to get us started. Thank you. Thanks for that intro, Dom. Um, yes, this is the first time doing the grand rounds. And by the way, I see people in the waiting room. So if you, I don't know if we can still let them in at this late date. Uh, I think it's fine to let people who come in a little bit late. Yeah, I um, believe that person's having some connection issues, but okay. everyone else is in. All right, great. And um, okay, so this uh, topic is working with the suicidal patient. I think it's such an important topic. I mean, I actually do think that um, we kind of give it short shrift. I used to actually give a version of this workshop a few years ago to the residents, but we stopped giving it. So, and hopefully I've updated a little bit today, but what I really hope to do is like, I don't know if there's any of the answers per se, quote unquote answers for this, but how to work with the suicidal patient is something that takes a lot of experience, brings up a lot of emotions. And I think the more we can think about it and talk about it, the better. Um, so with that in mind, I hope people will uh, chime in with their own personal comments, questions, suggestions, pearls, all that would be very uh, welcome. So if you have topics that you want covered or things that you're thinking about even now, feel free to chat uh, to Dom and he'll pick them up. Uh, I know this is the first time Zoom, uh, kind of this may be a first time Zoom lecture for many people. So we'll, I realize there may be a little bit of a learning curve. So I'm kind of excited about it actually. We'll, we're we'll, gonna do it all today and we'll see what, what, what works for future reference, okay. Um, so let me just see if I can move this ahead. Okay, so no disclosures. Uh, a little bit later, we're gonna have a, um, uh, a breakout group where we're gonna work on a shared Google Doc and that Google Doc Nick has put on the lower left here. So if you wanna kind of, if you have a moment and you wanna just type in HTTPS, uh, colon backslash backslash psych.ucsf.edu backslash share, you can get access to that. And you don't need to do it right now, but you'll, you'll want to get there later. So this is the outline of the talk. And um, first we'll start with their introduction and background. Then, uh, you know, really just getting to the nitty gritty of this of like, what do you do? And this is a metaphor kind of the person on the roof. So the acutely suicidal person what, what do you do? What, what are the kinds of things you should think about? Uh, then we'll go on to managing crises. So these are like right after you get the person off the roof or the person's not quite there, but it's still a crisis. You're worried about suicide. And the three subtopics under managing crisis would be what is crisis intervention and how do we do that? Uh, second is case management, and, uh, which is kind of a, more of a definitional thing, but something that's very important as we think about as we're managing crises. And then hospitalization, how, much, how, often, how often does the question of should we hospitalize or not come up? And I don't know how much formal training uh, people in the audience have had. I know I've had very little, uh, except from giving this kind of a workshop and lecture. So um, uh, I think it's an important uh, discussion to be had. 
And then finally talking about teach, or not finally, but next talking a little bit about teach, teachable skills. So once you've gotten over the acute crisis, what are the kinds of common skill sets that people who have been or were just uh, suicidal or who are chronically suicidal need? And then some of the common pain points, uh, I called it uh, troubleshooting. And then finally, if we have time, just a very brief coda about uh, every person who does complete die by suicide leaves behind six loved ones and how do we think about talking to them about uh, suicide and loss and so forth. So um, the big agenda, any one of these topics probably could be an hour, I would say. Uh, it's worth an hour, uh, but we're going to go through it all now as an outline and hopefully thinking about this as you build your skill sets going forward. So first let's talk about uh, introductions and background. Just, uh, just a note on uh, how these slides work. The blue slides are hopefully a more audience participation slides. The yellow slides are the slides where I give the outline so you know where you are, um, but just a little color coding uh, announcement there. Uh, so the first polling question, so Nick, if you wouldn't mind putting up the first polling question, I'm kind of curious about what are people's current statuses in the audience? Who am I talking with? And what are, uh, what's your background and so forth? And uh, while you're completing this uh, poll, um, I just want to make a note also, there's going to be a note on cultural linguistic competency. I'm really hoping that people can uh, make comments. I mean, this, this topic is so broad and then adding on the issue of linguistic and cultural competency. I hope people can make comments in the chat and Dom will be able to share some of them and I'll try to share whatever I can think of as they come up. I didn't get a chance to do like a literature search on this topic, uh, but it's certainly worth doing at some point. Okay, uh, so with that, it's, we've got a big spread here. I would say the most common folks are psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, evenly divided, which is really cool, and um, a smattering of everyone else too. So this is great. We have medical students, psychiatric residents, we have uh, MFT psychotherapists, nurses, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, and a few others too. Uh, I'm not really sure who they are. Maybe if you chat who you, who you are as the, in the other category and let Dom know, he can uh, make an announcement uh, in a moment. Okay, so this was my thought about the uh, add, add, uh, my request is please add uh, to our, the breakout comments or chats, any things you can think about cultural and linguistic competency. I actually think of this talk in a sense as actually being about the culture that we live in and questioning the culture we live in in terms of how do we approach suicidal individuals and how do we think about it uh, and making sure we're not in the same old rut of how we think about things. Okay, and this goes back to my other issues. I kind of feel like, but rather than just my feelings about it, let me actually ask you, how much formal training have you had in the management of suicidal persons? My sense is most people have not had much, but I'd be kind of curious about what people said. How, how much uh, training have people had in the management of suicidal individuals? So we're getting a pretty good, interesting kind of a spread here, uh, pretty mixed where it seems like most people have had around uh, two hours of various lectures and workshops combined. So, and I'd be curious about like, have you gone over the topics that we've gone over before? And, and please give me feedback about the, the topics that seem to have been reviewed in the past. And again, this is the management of suicidal patients, not, not so much the assessment. I kind of feel like we get a lot about how to assess patients uh, with suicidal ideation and so forth. But once we find out that they're suicidal, what do we do now? I don't know if we get as much uh, information in that regard or training. But it sounds like, it looks like we've, uh, everyone's had, most people have had two or more hours of training in this topic. So that's really fantastic. I'm actually kind of surprised. So give me more feedback if any of this is redundant. Um, but I think we have enough a broad array of topics that hopefully won't be too redundant. Um, so one thing that I'm not going to talk about much in this one hour lecture is really about the kind of theoretical background on which this is based on. Uh, what, and the kinds of individuals who uh, are suicidal, particularly chronically suicidal, repetitiously suicidal individuals is kind of the clinical term. Um, and helping us to think about instead of a risk orientation, more of a treatment orientation, uh, orientation in terms of our assessment. So this is a little table that I came up with. 
uh, adapted that. And the risk orientation, really looking at is the person suicidal? What are the risk factors? Uh, do they have intent? Have they had a plan? The, you know, the risk and the ideation intent plan uh, triangle, as I like to call it. Um, whereas in a treatment orientation, we're really trying to think of suicidality as part on the part of the patient is really a way that they're trying to solve problems. So reframing suicidality as problem solving. And that, uh, so risk factors and predicting whether the person's gonna commit suicide is very important in a risk orientation, but it's not as important in a treatment oriented framework. Uh, in risk orientation, we're trying to get rid of suicide at all costs, whereas in a treatment orientation, and this is a lot of it's based on an ACT kind of formulation, is I, would, I consider it as, it's a legitimate, it is an, a solution to the problem that the patient is reporting, but maybe not a good solution, is kind of how I would frame it. And I tend to think of it as patient has to convince me that uh, it is a, a good solution. I, be, I think I don't know if I've ever been convinced that it is a good solution, although there may be situations where um, uh, in people in terminal conditions and so forth, there is a legitimate um, moral stance, I believe, that people can say, this is enough for me, I don't want to go through any more pain. But in the case of a psychiatrist, in the, most, in the vast majority of the situations that we're thinking about in psychiatry, um, I've not been convinced that, uh, that it is the best form of problem solving. But it is a form of problem solving. I have to give the patient that part of it. But is there a better solution, I think, is the way to think of it. And so in that situation, you're thinking about talking about suicide a lot more in a risk orientation, really focusing on suicide, whereas in a problem, a treatment orientation, you're focused less on suicide because that's more one solution, but are there other, you're focused on like other alternative solutions and other ways of uh, 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 conceptualizing problems. So I'll get into the more of that later as we go forward. Um, part of the background also is like, what are the treatments for suicidality? Not too many things have been actually tested dialectal behavior therapy as being the number one thing treated and uh, uh, number one treatment that has been studied. And then uh, the last one is kind of an interesting new more systems approach to uh, suicidality. It's the CAMS approach. Um, I'm not super, I'm not a practitioner of CAMS. It's come out in the last few years, but I've read a little bit about it. It's kind of very interesting to me. But so we have these treatments for suicidality. Are there common elements to them that we can take home if we're not going to be doing any one of these uh, treatments with the patient? One is a clear uh, treatment framework. Two is management and anticipation of suicide crises. So making sure you're planning in advance for suicidal crises. Affect tolerance. Um, the therapist is active and exploratory. And there's a plan embedded in that treatment and all these treatments for uh, suicidal patients is that there's going to be change. So there's a change orientation. So uh, let me stop there and see, do we have any questions or comments, Dom, that you want to share with what I've gone so far? Uh, not at this point. Um, okay. But the other, just for the other participant, was uh, a drama therapist. Excellent. Very good. Welcome. So let me go on to this topic, the person on the roof. I, um, I have to say, I haven't been in this situation very frequently. Uh, maybe a couple of times in my life, I've been on the phone with someone who, or I've been really worried about, and I've been trying to frantically calling about and trying to wave down help. I've been in a couple situations where the resident's been on the phone, and I've been scurrying around with a couple colleagues on, in the hallways uh, of Langley Porter trying to make sure we're getting the correct support. Uh, but just thinking about um, the person on the roof, the acutely suicidal person, and, you know, person on the roof may be a metaphor for like you have someone on the phone who's acutely suicidal or has some sort of means nearby or is thinking about driving the Golden Gate Bridge and so forth. That's kind of what's meant by person on the roof. Um, there's an article um, called, What Would You Say to the Person on the Roof, from which the next uh, series of slides are derived from. Now, I'd like everyone, let's try a uh, group activity here. If people could go to the annotate function, it's on the view, uh, uh, bar at the top says attitude. If you click on that, what I'd like you to do is read through this, which of the following are important first steps in talking with a person on the roof and see if you can check box these boxes here. And I'll see if I can do it even. So I've done a couple here. So if you can give that a try, I don't know if other people can do that or is it only me, Nick? Oh, some other people are trying. 
give it a try. I'll give people another a minute or so just to see if they can find the annotate button. And uh, once you get the annotate bar up, there's a bunch of different options you can draw. There's a stamp function that you can use, which I was using. See if you can change colors. Okay, cool. Okay, actually, we're getting it. Uh, people are. I'm not sure what people mean by test when they say uh, first talk first steps in talking with a person on a roof. If you want to chat Dom and let him know what you mean by test. Dom, is anyone replying with what they mean by test as the other suggestions? Not yet. Perhaps it's just a system thing. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Speak to family members. That's excellent. I really like that. That's the text function. Got it. All right. So we got a good spread of ideas here. I'm going to give it another 10 seconds before I move on. Thank you for these, um, uh, these thoughts. Excellent. I think people are getting the hang of this. Cool. All right. I, I think I'll use this again in the future, but just want to double check. All right. I'm going to move on. Hope that's okay. I'm going to, unfortunately, need to clear this. Maybe I'll save a screenshot of this so we can see. Okay. I'm going to have to clear all the pictures. Sorry about that. But I think everyone kind of checked a lot of them, which is kind of the idea. So the basics of talking to the person on the roof is really one, ensure safety. You know, and when I say ensure safety, that means you may not be able to do that for the person on the roof, but your own safety. Don't put yourself in any situation where you will be yet another casualty. Uh, don't leave the person alone. That kind of, I think, goes without saying. Uh, alert others, especially the team. If you have other team members around, as I mentioned, I've been on the, uh, been on the team where the residents on the phone with the suicidal person and we're scurrying around trying to get help. Uh, also the police. Now the police, in fact, have members oftentimes who are practiced and this is their job. Um, I don't know what, I've forgotten his name now, but there's a guy whose job it is to talk down people from Golden Gate Bridge and he does it all the time. So that person has a ton of expertise and experience. Many situations that you're in, you're probably the one with the most experience, but in certain situations, there will be other people around who actually have more experience than you do. It's, it's totally good and reasonable to let them take over. Um, another thing to think about is when you're on the phone with someone is to maintain communication. So uh, if by accident the line drops or something like that, make sure you get the person's phone number if possible. If you can get their address, that's really ideal in advance. So just say something along the lines of, hey, I know we're talking here, but just in case our communication breaks off, can you give me your phone number or where you're at so I can uh, reconnect if something happens? And then obviously, then the other obvious things, if this person has means nearby, see if you can get rid of them and make sure it can be, if, if it can be done safely. Obviously, if the person has a firearm or something, you're not going to grab it or do anything like that, but ask them to put it away. Typically people, um, I think in movies, you might see people say, oh, give me the gun. Don't do that. Have them put it in a drawer and close the drawer so it's not in anyone's line of sight. It's not close to anyone, far away from everyone. That would be ideal. Don't ask for the gun, I think, is another thing that I've been told. I haven't had to do it myself, fortunately. Okay. So we'll move on to the next thing. And then now in the, in, the, in the conversation that you're having with the person, there are two major processes that's described. One is the participant that you're trying to be empathic with the uh, individual, and the other is the challenger, meaning you're trying to show that there's a way out to the person. So you're trying to, in some ways, instill some sort of hope while at the same time maintaining empathy. Um, and then interestingly, some of these, one of the reasons why all these, I think, techniques kind of work or are reasonable to discuss about is because there's some common pathways that people get to when they're suicidal and they're in certain, similar certain places uh, all the time. I think, I hate to quote Trotsky, but I think he said something like, whenever, if someone gets tickled by a feather, everyone has their own response about how they laugh and how they giggle and so forth. But if someone gets burned with a, a red hot poker, everyone has this exact same response. So when people are in acute crises, like a suicidal crisis, they often have common pathways that we can now, we can use given our, uh, um, if we have experience or we, we can think about it in that way. Okay, so what might you say to communicate empathy? So this is two parts. Again, if, for those interested in the details, so this is an excellent article, it's not that long, in fact. Um, uh, so one is introducing yourself, 
communicating that you understand that the person is suffering. It's okay to say that you're scared also. It's reasonable. Reasonable to give your honest attitude about suicide. And then there are certain common pathways in which people think about others, like others are better off if, you, if the person were dead or you want to put, the person wants to punish other people or the person doesn't care what other people think. These are very common responses and um, there are ways to address each one of those, which I'm not going to get into today, but just so you know that these kinds of things have been thought through and these are common things to say to communicate empathy. Um, how, many, how might you might communicate ways out besides suicide? There's a number of different things that you can say that can be helpful. Um, uh, you can read them for yourself. I'm not going to read them each one here. Um, uh, not abandoning the person. I did want to mention psychiatric medications, though, because a lot of times, a few times I've been, the, that the person feels like they can't sleep and they're just like going crazy from not being able to sleep. You know, I, I often say kind of tongue in cheek, I'm not quite as good as an anesthesiologist, but as a psychiatrist, I'm probably in second place in terms of doctors who can help pe put people to sleep. So psychiatric medications can be a temporary, it can be a very helpful relief to offer that to people. Uh, mentioning that suffering is temporary, that people are blinded by suffering. Uh, I, I also mentioned that many people have been in your situation and have, survi and have survived and are living happily. Uh, I have that in the next slide. And uh, your loved ones will be harmed. And then when this crisis is over, you'll be stronger. Sometimes mentioning any of these things do seem like reasonable things to do. There may be other comments that you'd like to make or other pearls. If you have them, please add them to the chat and uh, Dom will share them. Uh, these are some famous people who have attempted suicide. I find it kind of helpful just to know the names of some of them. So you mention them to people. It, it actually is kind of a, people are surprised that some of these people have actually attempted suicide and survived. So um, it's kind of good just to have some names in your pocket, I think. Okay, uh, let me take a little pause there. Dom, do we have any uh, comments at this point? Uh, not as yet. Okay, great. We're, we're uh, right on schedule here, so we're doing good. So let me go on to managing crisis, crisis intervention. Uh, so, okay, let's, let's do, is this a, I think this is a poll question, Nick. Can we, can we put this one? Which of the following is a basic principle of crisis intervention? I'll let everyone read them and kind of think on their own. Okay, I'll give people another two seconds and we'll uh, end the polling. Do you want to end the polling, Don? And you want to share the results? Yeah. Ah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fair bit of uh, uh, spread there. And all of these are kind of, I mean, it kind of depends on the culture in which we live. I'm, I'm kind of, I, I kind of, I lean toward E, viewing the, the crisis as an opportunity for learning. And I'll go through why in a moment. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, we use the term crisis intervention a lot, and when I poll most audiences, I think most people can't give a reasonable definition of what uh, crisis intervention is. So if you kind of think about it now, like if I asked you, what's your definition of uh, uh, crisis intervention? What would it be? Now, uh, the, the, this is a kind of a little bit of a cliche, but in Chinese, uh, the word um, for crisis, wei ji, means actually danger and opportunity. So there is in every uh, crisis an opportunity. And this is a quote from Ron Manuel, never let a good crisis go to waste. And I definitely find that true. Um, and so what is, now this is, unfortunately this is used, uh, the, the term is in the definitions, but I still think it's a reasonable definition. So interventions used to offer immediate short-term help to individuals who experience a crisis. So that's an event that produces emotional, uh, mental, physical, or behavioral distress or problems. Or crisis is when, Available resources over, are overwhelmed by the demands is another way of thinking of crisis. So oftentimes these are emotional and mental demands. So I think of um, the main principles for crisis intervention are that crises are an opportunity for learning. Now you have to respond to the immediate crisis. And I think of it as you're trying to help the patient problem solve. When the patient comes in a crisis as a suicide crisis, they're thinking they're overwhelmed. Their idea is that I don't have any options except suicide. The idea, the idea is to actually help problem solve a little better and to look at what are the problems and what are the potential solutions. So um, uh, it turns out that, and I, I, I skipped this part, I cut this part out of this presentation, but there's a fair bit of research looking at um, uh, individuals who are particularly who are suicidal or have been suicidal and then particularly repetitiously suicidal individuals. 
But individuals who are suicidal, for example, actually have been shown to have poor problem solving skills, for example, and also poor um, autobiographical memory, interestingly, and greater harm avoidance. So these are some of like the neurocognitive features of individuals with, uh, who present with suicidal. And now it's not, it's kind of a, these are stereotypes in um, uh, um, more epidemiological statistics, but more often than not, that person who is suicidal in front of you is trying to solve some sort of problem and they're not doing a, they can use some help with that. Okay, so I think of, uh, they're needing help problem solving. So thinking of as suicide as the solution, not the problem itself, but as a solution, what is the problem? And then many individuals who are poor at problem solving have trouble identifying a specific problem. The problems are often very vague and nebulous. So, uh, so another principle in this, so sorry about that tangent, but another principle is you want to be direct, candid, and calm in the situation. It turns out most crises are non-fatal and suicidality is usually self-limited. If you can get the person through the next 24 to 48 hours, they're usually feeling a lot better. I know how many times you've gone to see someone in the emergency room or seen them a day or two later. They may have been acutely suicidal earlier, but by a few hours have elapsed, a day or two has elapsed, this, that acute crisis often has uh, self-limited. So when you're thinking about working with, uh, in this, when you're developing a plan, your action plan, the time horizon should be, maybe be one or two days. It doesn't have to be like, okay, we're going to solve all your problems now. In fact, that's often the problem. The person feels they're going to be homeless and so forth. But Let's figure out what's going to happen in the next one to two days, let alone, you know, the next 10 years, which is often what happens that trigger, that can sometimes be the things that trigger suicidal crises. Um, now, the action plans that you develop with patients. Now, the crisis intervention, I guess the other part that I, I, I didn't mention was you are actually, in a way, functioning as the patient's problem solver uh, per se. So you're actually going through and thinking with the person, what are the different, what's the problem? Have, honing down the problem, thinking about different kinds of solutions, and you're developing an action plan with the patient. The action plan should be specific, detailed, and doable. You can come up with these action plans in advance, and this is kind of a crisis card as an example of something I've done with a patient years ago, but it was a simple thing. If they started feeling suicidal, the plan was do not drink, or if I am drinking, stop. Two, sit down and take 10 deep breaths. Three, contact my brother and talk for five minutes about the last movie we saw together. Four, write down what happens so I can discuss with Dr. Lee what happened. And five, if it's after 10 p.m., take my meds like I'm supposed to and go to bed. So I, I often, that, that last one is a good little tip too, is oftentimes, a lot of times people like never go to bed angry or whatever. But a lot of times these suicidal crises occur when the person's really tired, really exhausted. It's the end of a really long day. A lot of bad things have happened. Sometimes it's better just to go to, take some meds, regroup and go back. Start over the next day. Things look really different in the morning. Uh, so this is a vague action plan. I don't know if you watched, how many of you have watched Star Wars, but this is Darth Vader telling Luke Skywalker, and he says, I am your father. I don't know how many of you saw this episode, but do you guys remember what happens after this? So Luke does, he jumps. And I think what Darth meant to say was, take two Seroquel and call me in the morning. Things might have looked really different to Luke the next day. I don't know. Darth is not, is this such a bad guy? I don't know. Anyway, so let, let me just re, re uh, reinforce the kind of the major principles, crisis intervention for acute su suicidality, going back and thinking about your situation and your formulation. Remember to consider the status of a psychiatric disorder because there can be an exact, there may not just be a problem per se, but there can be exacerbation of um, psychosis uh, or the person can be actively intoxicated. And then the other thing to think about for crisis intervention is increasing the level of support that you always want to involve other people once you get to that point. Hey, Descartes, yes. uh, there was a question that is relevant to the first uh, bullet, and I'll just read it. What are specific considerations for addressing suicidal crisis in someone with psychosis, given the high rates of suicide deaths among people with schizophrenia? Uh, so I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Sure. Flash. I mean, I think in this situation, part of the problem is decompensated psychosis. So, and this may be jumping the gun a little bit, but I do think that in these situations, hospitalization to reestablish medications can be really helpful. Was there more to that, Don? No, I think it was just... Uh, so yeah, yeah. It's, uh, that's one of, to my mind, one of the more clear examples of where a, a hospitalization can come in, it can be really useful uh, to get the person restabilized on medications and so forth. Uh, and then things to think about when you're dealing with these crises. 
in a sense, uh, and for the repetitiously uh, suicidal individual, they may have gotten to a pattern or a rut, I like to think of it as where whenever they get into a problem, they do begin to think about suicide. And it kind of does work in the short term. So for example, if your crisis is you feel really lonely and then you start telling people that you're suicidal, it does resolve, it does actually solve the problem, but it does come at a longer term cost. So what we were trying to do is we want to reward attempts to address the crisis without suicidal behavior. So we're going to try to help the patient not, and this is in particular for the repetitiously suicidal individual, we're going to try to help them address crises without resorting to suicide. We want to establish a specific crisis protocol or plan for each patient. We want to remember that suicidality uh, occurs after hours too, hence the card. And then in advance of crises, you, it is helpful to think about a hospitalization policy. Particularly, it will help your colleagues who are on call to think about whether hospitalization makes sense or not. So this is a little bit of a plea that if you can think ahead that does a hospitalization make sense, if, especially if it's a chronically suicidal individual, to give some guidelines for your colleagues there. Um, I think for patients with, say, uh, acute decompensated psychosis from mania or mixed episodes or schizophrenia, then hospitalization makes a lot more sense because they need to go back and be restabilized on their medications. For other patients with um, chronic suicidality, we begin to sense, and I think this may be a common feeling that everyone's had, that it may not actually be that helpful in the long run. So yes, it might help in the short run, but in the long run, the person just keeps coming back to the hospital more and more. So we'll talk about that in a moment. And I think it's a very important issue to, to discuss. Uh, the other key issue is how to address suicide without reinforcing it or by over-focusing over -focusing on it. So in the ACT parlance, by trying to get rid of something directly, you actually can make it worse. So for example, if I say, whatever you do, don't think about a banana, that will make it worse. So the same way, if you try to tell someone, whatever you do, don't think about suicide, that doesn't necessarily make it get better. Um, so, uh, so thinking about suicide, again, as a solution, not as a problem. So you want to spend more time focusing on what is the problem that the patient is presenting with. So, uh, uh, this is a, a little list of things that I uh, thought of uh, about managing the suicidal patient by phone. Um, if you're on the phone with the person, dispose of means. I like to ask the patient to write notes for the next session, have a brief problem-solving discussion, and then schedule a time to talk later. I find it's much more helpful to be succinct, and I don't can't tell you how many times I've been on these long, rambling telephone calls with people who are semi-suicidal, especially as a re when I was a resident, that I kind of over time learned to, it's better to keep it brief. It's good to check in, respond quickly, make it brief, schedule a time to talk later, have the person write down notes. That, I think that does a, a fair bit. If, they're taking med, if they need some medications to sleep, give them some medications to sleep, talk about the next day after they've had a good night's sleep. And I think after a few of these, the patient gets the idea and begins to be able to do that without your help. And I think those of you who are familiar with DBT kind of get the sense of this also. Um, DBT also recommends considering random telephone check-ins. That helps with reinforcing suicidal attention to suicidal behavior. So if every time the person feels suicidal, they get a phone call from you, but not other times, guess what? You, you are reinforcing certain kinds of behavior. If you just call randomly at, from time to time, like every, you know, in a week or two or something, just, hey, I want to check in with you. How are things going? Uh, it means a lot to patients, and also you're not reinforcing suicidal behavior. So uh, first thing, ask about suicidal and self-injurious behavior. That's what SIB stands for. That says, please don't. If you that's the first thing out of your mouth, you don't want to do that because, again, you're inadvertently reinforcing that that's what you as the therapist are most interested in. Okay, let me go. Uh, I'm running a little bit behind time, but not too bad. Kate, I want to have time for the breakout groups also. So uh, case management. How many of you know what case management is, and how is it different from crisis intervention? Um, I think case management kind of gets a bad rap, like it means to many people, like you go to the pharmacy or the grocery store with the patient or the bank. I don't think of it that way at all. I really like the definition of case management as a coordination of care through a variety of settings. So think about it. what does case management actually mean? It means that through a variety of settings. So how do you do that? You influence other people to support your patient. And how do you do that? You're communicating. Most importantly, I think you're communicating the the diagnostic formulation with everyone. I, this person has schizophrenia, this person has bipolar disorder and they've stopped taking their lithium. That's communicating your uh, formulation. Then you develop, and then you, there's a treatment plan that, and you wanna communicate that treatment plan to everyone else. That's part of being a case manager. You're 
the assessment, the diagnosis, and the plan, you're, you're communicating to everyone so they all are on board with the same thing. You're dealing with obstacles in care um, and resolving potential conflicts in the environment. I guess bullets three and four are very similar. So for example, a person goes to the emergency department, you might give a call in advance, you're telling them what the diagnosis is, your diagnostic formulation, what you think the plan should be, and trying to resolve conflicts before they occur. So that's crisis ma uh, case management. And I, I think we all do it. A good doctor should do this with all patients. Uh, we have a special term for it in psychiatry called case management, but um, this is basically what it is. Okay, so uh, hospitalization. Now this is a, a thorny issue that comes a lot up a lot for us, particularly those on the CL service and who cover the emergency department is to hospitalize or not to hospitalize? That is the question. So what I'd like to do is do a breakout here. And I think we have people randomly gonna be organized into groups of four or five. I think it's four uh, or five. And then the question is hospitalization of the suicidal patient. What I want you to do is you're gonna ask, think about, you're gonna discuss these questions for about five or 10 minutes with your small group. What are the negative, potential negative consequences of hospitalizations? How can hospitalization help? What is the evidence for this? And what I want in the breakout group is you're gonna do a breakout group, we're gonna have eight minutes. When you come back, we'll have an update. And if you have questions, ask them in the chat. What I want you to do is go to this uh, Google Doc right now and open it up. And you're gonna fill it out for your group. So you, and you can't copy and paste or click on the link, unfortunately, you just have to type it in. And when you're in the group, what I want you to do is you can find out what group, what breakout group you're in, one person be the scribe, write down everyone's name, and then have a little discussion about the topics that I, that I mentioned here. So you'll be in breakout rooms here, five minutes to discuss the prompt, open the Google Doc linked in the chat, once in your breakout group, identify a scribe, find your breakout room number, add your names to the Google Doc, discuss and type at least one thought into the Google Doc. Okay, so uh, Nick, can we give it a try here? Okay, very. this is awesome, this is great. Uh, what I'd like to do is maybe we can get uh, one person from each breakout room that we're, we're able to master the, this relatively cumbersome process of doing the Google Doc. And by the way, as you're typing, if you uh, can chat or uh, jot down some feedback to give later, be super helpful. Uh, I, uh, so why don't, why don't we go with breakout? Uh, if anyone has any feedback, just think about it, right? I'm really interested in how this is run, working for people. It's really kind of weird for me. I don't get that much. Uh, I see your, some people's faces, but that, that much. But for breakout room one, who wants to be the spokesperson and kind of what were the takeaways from that? Okay, thank you. Uh, I was trying to unmute myself earlier. So I think for us, um, both Nicole and Emma, sure that they've had experience with having to do 5150s. Myself, I haven't, but um, they were focused primarily um, around just kind of the distinction around the drug use and what um, in which instances for particular drugs it might be useful for a 5150, such as with methamphetamines, to kind of get over that particular. Um, the chronicity of the use or what was going on in that particular um, instance when they were high versus opiates, um, in which case it may lead them to uh, use more opiates later. Um, and then also just looking at the disruption that happens with the 5150. Um, and so Emma was saying that she often asks for a voluntary 5150 rather than uh, an involuntary so that that they can kind of not have that traumatic experience of being pulled out of whatever their lives were. But uh, it could be useful as far as opening up linkages for the patients who were referred or who were 5150 themselves. Excellent, Connie. Thank you. I think we, let's move, I, just because we have limited amount of time at this point, I'm a little worried about that. Can we go to breakout room number two? Anyone that want to speak up for breakout room number two? All right, hi, this is Jennifer. I can speak a little bit from breakout room number two. We talked a little bit about kind of just again that negative reinforcement um, that sometimes particularly patient personality disorder regress a little bit in the hospital as opposed to getting better or that it 
encourages some kind of kind of passivity um, that they uh, kind of disempowers them to um, work on their own coping skills. We did talk about positive uh, effects as well that um, you know medications can be titrated more quickly um, and just buying a little bit of time to keep them safe. Great. I'm going to skip uh, rooms three uh, and room four. Does someone else? I was at. The, I was in breakout room four, but does someone from the group want to just summarize really briefly what we discussed? Hi, Ricard. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for leading that breakout room. Um, we talked about how the hospitalization can uh, be disruptive to patients' patients' lives and cause more problems for in terms of psychosocial stressors that they are facing. Um, might be re-traumatizing depending upon the the, um, the nature of their presentation, uh, the lack of autonomy that occurs in patients, especially on a 5150, um, and then if there has has to be restraints used, um, uh, it could be very expensive for the patient, and um, depending on where uh, which um, inpatient hospitalization or where they're having their inpatient hospitalization. Um, there may be more or less access to, to genuine treatment as opposed to just um, making it through a, a period of crisis. All right, I'm going to have to interrupt. These are some great comments, though. I hope, we, Nick, we can save the Google Doc, right? And people can, um, uh, can look at it. Um, Absolutely. So I'm sorry. I just sincerest apologies that these are great. No, no not on any of the comments, but just I just feel like we need to kind of keep moving here. Uh, in the remaining 10 minutes. So that was the updates. So um, uh, actually, there, there, um, uh, we do know that after hospital discharge, suicide rates are really high. You know, uh, uh, and this one said 100 times the global suicide rate, but still it's only 0.28%. So it's still kind of low, but it, it doesn't seem like from in a long-term view, we have no data that hospital dis hospitalization actually helps in the long run. I've actually seen uh, Marsha Linehan talk and, and be a, huge advocate of this very point. We have no data and we need more studies. Um, and we, we discussed many of the downsides of hospitalizations. Um, in, interestingly, hospitals very rarely implement any of the therapies that are specifically designed to reduce suicide. Most inpatient units are not set up to do DBT or mentalization therapy or anything like that. So um, you usually don't get direct treatment for a suicide or suicide level crises in hospital settings. Uh, only two uh, randomized controlled trials have examined the effects of hospitalization on suicide uh, outcomes, and neither were adequately powered, and both were inconclusive. Uh, this is an interesting, this is a little debate uh, that people had that they uh, were, oops, this is a little debate that uh, on two sides with nice references if you want to look up these RCTs and so forth. Uh, I think of hospitalization as will the hospitalization advance problem solving? So if the person's acutely decompensated with psychosis, they can't even think straight, yes, hospitalization may help because then they can get back on their meds and uh, do better uh, and be able to problem solve. It's not a good way to deal with your own anxiety though. And you do see this in EDs a fair bit. It's kind of the dumping, the, the psychiatric version of the dumping syndrome. I think there's some other GI dumping syndrome, but I'm not gonna get into that. Um, and if you're anxious about the patient, it's just better to get a consultation. Sometimes an ED is a good place to get a consultation. It's very acute. But thinking of it as a consult, as opposed to this person needs to be hospitalized, might be a better way to go. Um, and then the issue of managing the patient who wants to be hospitalized. Um, and I just a little caveat there is, in some patients, it is reasonable to hospitalize people who want to be hospitalized and not to hospitalize people who don't want to be hospitalized. Sometimes hospitalization actually is a step up for the person in terms of it's a better problem solving. Going to the ED and getting themselves admitted is better problem solving than attempting to kill themselves. That's not as good problem solving. So if the hospitalization represents improved problem solving, then you might go for that. But then the next level would be hospitalization won't be the best solution in the long run either. You want to go to the next level beyond that and actually directly work on other problems. Um, this is a, just a common um, checklist of things you can do before discharging a person from your office if they're suicidal or from the ED. Make sure that firearms and lethal medications have been secured or removed. The supportive person is available. 
follow-up appointment with a mental health professional has been scheduled, and the patient has the name and number of a clinician can be called in an emergency. If any one of these things cannot be secured, then yeah, hospitalization might be something you might have to think more uh, closely about. Uh, I like this quote from Winston Churchill, if you're going through hell, keep going. Um, so that's the managing crisis piece. And I, for lack of time, I'm going to plow ahead a little bit here, talking about the teachable skills. Now, I did mention that given the common characteristic of suicidal people, and there's a lot of research showing that they may have deficits, some neurocognitive deficits, particularly around autobiographical memory and deficits in problem solving, which are really interesting topics in and of themselves, but I don't have time to get into them. But given this uh, characteristics, some of the teachable skills you could do would be like helping the patient self-monitor that helps them like even like uh, mood charting helps people remember things in more detail that helps to deal with autographical memory deficits, problem solving. Patients with um, um, who are suicidal have problems with problem solving, uh, particularly have more passive problem solving kind of uh, modes. So passive meaning like, well, if I were feeling lonely, what would you do? I would you know, sit around and wait for a phone call from my friend. That's a more passive uh, problem solving stance. And obviously things like interpersonal effectiveness from DBT or values from uh, acceptance commitment therapy can be useful uh, for people uh, in this, these as longer term skills. Uh, this is the collaborative uh, assessment and management of suicidality. There's a manual written about it. There's, they have a form that you follow. It's kind of interesting. I know not that much about it except what's on these slides here. Uh, going on to troubleshooting. Now, there's some common, I'd say, pain points you bump into when you're working with suicidal individuals. Uh, common thing that happens is focusing too much on uh, suicide itself. Another thing is going too fast, meaning you think the person's better than they are, you've overcome the suicide, but they still have these other longer-term deficits that you've missed. There's the halo effect, meaning right after the acute crisis is over, everyone feels particularly good. Uh, and there's a tendency to forget about suicide as well. And then um, individuals who are suicidal, particularly repetitiously suicidal individuals, tend to have more than one problem. It's not as if they just have suicide as their one problem. They also have multi-problem individuals, and counter-transference with these individuals can be really strong. Um, so that's why I think having these kinds of DBT groups for therapists is super helpful because it begins to help you troubleshoot each one of these kinds of things. Uh, how would you respond to the following patient comments? I've, dealt with, I've been these, I don't know if I've responded that well. Uh, could have done another breakout room about how to deal with that, but I wrote down some of the answers that have been discussed in, in other places like this book that I'm gonna recommend at the end. So it's just a summary of common problems, troubleshooting, how to respond to these situations and how to respond to these patient statements. Um, and so that's the bulk of the talk. I want to just give one shout out that there's a coda, this after a suicide. Um, for every one person who commits suicide, they leave six loved ones behind. We're fortunate to have uh, Chris Galloway in the audience here, who's the uh, really leader at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, we all uh, are familiar with the Werther effect, the copycat suicide. This is Yukita Kata, one of the first ones in 1986 where this was well documented. Um, and then, then there are actually some uh, basic um, uh, guidelines on how to deal with uh, post-suicide and ways of doing, I'm not gonna read the details, um, and, but these are some key kind of baseline ideas about how to do with this. And by the way, I know I'm going through this really quickly. I'm gonna have all the slides available for you, to all the participants uh, right after this is over. Um, and then finally, just a shout out to the AFSP and Survive, International Survivor Suicide Loss Day. Uh, Chris Galloway and I have been doing this for uh, a number of years now, and um, uh, I hope uh, anyone who's interested will participate. It's a really good learning experience for trainees, not only the ins and outs of suicide and how to think about it, but also how to help families dealing with bereavement and grief. I think it's a really, um, uh, it's a poignant uh, event. It's not a... Uh, uh, a light event necessarily, but there can be humor in it. And I think as people try to come to terms with loss of loved ones, uh, it's a very special place to be. Uh, so and that occurs at Parnassus. I don't know, it's gonna be this year. I don't know how what it's gonna look like, but in the past it's been at our auditorium. This is a book that I really recommend. This is the second edition. I haven't read it yet. I love the first edition. Gonna have this on my to-do read look, uh, book list, but if you have to read, read one book, this is it. 
and references available on request. And just thank you so much for participating in this kind of exper experimental uh, lecture. I've had uh, I got one minute left. I just want to do a quick summary. We did a background on all this. I think we do get some. Looks like people are getting more um, practice on management than they had in the past. But just give feedback about what things are redundant or if this is new material for people. I think each one of these topics could have been an hour long or more workshop. We talked about how to talk to a person on the roof, like in the acute suicidal situation, remembering the empathy and the challenger, kind of the dual roles that you have. Managing crises where you have to get in there and problem solve with the person, thinking about helping the person identify problems and identifying solutions. Once the crisis is over, individuals often have skills deficits that can be remediable. And then uh, there are uh, troubleshooting, meaning the issues that come up are common in many situations and that we get a lot from working together and thinking about them together. And then finally, what to do after a suicide. And there are ways of talking to people about suicides that have occurred already. Um, and then um, thinking again about the AFSP uh, International Suicide Survivors Day. First Saturday, uh, the Saturday before Thanksgiving. So that's it for my time. I want to thank you all very much for attending and please Feedback, feedback, feedback. Really appreciate it and um, have a good day. Thank you, Descartes. Thank you, everybody. And we'll uh, make slides uh, available and send up participant evaluations. Stay tuned. And we'll end the meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dom, do you want to stay on with me for just a minute or two? And Nick? We'll just yes. For just a minute or two, just to post hash? Yes. And we'll say goodbye to everybody else. We'll say goodbye to everyone else. Thank you.